Hi, my name is Alice Kuypers and I'm the author of 13 books that have been published and quite a few more that haven't. I would say for every book I've written, there is at least one or two or three that languish in a never to be read file or in a I have received a lot of rejections file. And so the 13 books that I've published are books for young adults, five novels, three chapter books, two high low books, which are high concept with an easier reading capability for young readers and two picture books as well. I also have published a book of nonfiction about teen Carly Allison and her inspiring and amazing story. But a lot of what I've written has been, as well as for children and young readers, also for adults. And I've had stories uh, published in magazines and shared on the radio, and I've worked on longer adult projects. So I've written pretty much every type of writing and I'm hoping in this time we have together that you are going to get to do some writing based on some of the things I've learned along the way in my journey as a writer. So the premise of our time together is that I believe if you're writing in long form, either stories, a novel, non-fiction, with a creative leaning or anything for younger readers, chapter books, middle grade, there needs to be scenic elements. And I hark on about this quite a lot when I'm doing evaluations for people, when they share their manuscripts with me and when I teach workshops. And some of you who are tuning in may have listened to me talking about some of these elements before but I actually think they're really key. And I was lucky to learn this early on with an editor over at HarperCollins in the States who said to me that you need to think about your novel like it's a necklace. And upon it, this string, you have pearls. And to create your pearl necklace, each of your scenes needs to be full and fully rounded and shine. And as I investigated what that meant, I began to learn from other great writers and readers and educators and my own reading that if you look at each of those pearls on that necklace, what you'll see is that scenes often have these four key elements. And if they don't have them, it's because the writer has chosen deliberately not to use one of those elements. So what I wanted to do was talk about each of those four elements with you, do some exercises where you will be writing so that you get to experience on the page exactly what this means, and also read a little bit from some of the books that I've brought with me to show you perhaps what I mean when I'm talking about what a scene is. So my first reading is from my YA novel, Me and Me, and what this scene is illustrating is that basically when you use all of those four elements hopefully what the effect is is the reader really feels like they are in the story with you. The main character's name is Lark and she has just had a phone call that something serious has happened to her father. I've been in the waiting room at St. Mary's Hospital for so long I've lost track of time. Lyrics slip through my mind about life and death, about rooms where we wait. This heart thing, Dad told me it was under control, but nothing's under control. Everything's random. A sob catches in my throat. Reed pushes my lipstick red hair from my cheek. It's going to be fine. Your dad is strong. He lifts his glasses off and rubs the skin under his eye with a knuckle. I loved your mum, he says. Everyone did. She was so kind to my family when we moved here. He presses his hands lightly around mine as if trying to give me strength. You probably don't even know all the things she did for us. She brought my parents bedding, introduced mum to people, helped us find schools like a fairy godmother. Is that why you were at the cemetery where you found dad? I go every year to pay respect to her. I mean, I make sure not to get in your way or your dad's. I look at him for a moment. 
You saved his life, I say. What if you hadn't been there? A doctor with white hair and two different coloured eyes, one milky blue, one deep brown, sticks his head round the entryway. Lark, Hardy. Oh, please tell me he's OK. Though we don't think he's had a heart attack, we're concerned about how hard he hit his head when he fell. It's fortunate your friend found him when he did. He launches into medical speak. The refrain, heart attack, heart attack, makes it impossible to hear. I interrupt, can I see him? You can visit for a short time. I glance at Reed, who says, Do you want me to come? I shake my head. I'll be here, he says. I follow the doctor. So the thinking for me around scenes and what those four elements are is that there are distinct things that each of us as writers are good at. And so... For me, I'm starting with the one that I find the hardest, and that scenic element is description. And so every scene needs description to help root the reader and help them feel like they are seeing, but also feeling and experiencing the scene as if it's happening around them. Some of the tips I've learned for writing a description is it's actually interesting how it changes for different age groups. You don't want long description for a young reader, and I'm quite good at that. But if you're writing for an older reader, they need that rooting in reality or fantasy or whatever it is that you're describing so that they can picture and imagine what the place is. And as readers, I think it's quite common for us to feel frustrated if we don't know where the characters are in that scene that they're experiencing. If one minute you think they're in a cafe, but in fact they're in their garden, or one minute you feel like they're on the beach, but hang on, the writer seems to have shifted and now they're driving somewhere. It can be really difficult to feel really rooted in place. And when you don't feel rooted in place, you can't experience the story fully. So when you're writing description, there are some things that you can do to practice to get better. And one of those things is to take time to observe the world around you. Writers are observers. Our job really is to pay attention to what's happening around us all the time. Every time you take the dog over the road, you could jot a note in your phone about what the weather actually feels like. So when it comes to putting weather in your fantasy novel or your middle grade book or your non-fiction maybe remembering what it was like to live in the prairies many years ago you can add those details so you're not just saying it was hot because when you make those notes on a day-to-day by basis you start to pay attention to the sound of things the texture the actual way the light falls at different times of day you notice whether The air tastes of something. Maybe some of you remember when it was very smoky in Saskatchewan last summer. Or perhaps there's a heaviness or a tension in the air because rain is building. And you can take those descriptive powers to anywhere that you travel. And while none of us are traveling, you can use those practices that you do on a daily basis, those actual observations, as you take yourself through Google Earth and try to imagine what it would be like. One of the things I do if I need my character to travel somewhere is read a lot of description by other people who've been to that place and really notice those sensory details. So something else you can think about is which sensory detail do you really want to focus on? Because you don't need to clutter your writing with lots of these details. You just need to choose maybe one for a younger reader maybe three or four for an adult reader, and really hone in. Dickens is really good at pulling and finding those details so you feel fully submersed in the scene. And then, as you write your description, think about how your character is experiencing it. So rather than saying your character is tall, you could say he hit his head on the low beam that crossed the doorway into the gloomy kitchen. And that gives you a sense, oh, he's bigger than the space. So there's ways to then use the words and language that you're creating to really make that description happen. 
What you'll notice as a reader is when there's too much description, it really slows the book down. But if you're getting feedback and rejections that are saying, it's too breathy, it's too fast, I'm not feeling really connected, you're probably not spending enough time on description. And that description extends, of course, to characters too. What details do you notice about the other people? What is a key element that helps you really clarify what that person would look like or feel like to someone else meeting them. Maybe they have a crescent moon on their forearm as a tattoo and that makes you wonder a little bit as a reader, oh, I'm starting to maybe guess what this person might be like. So each of those details gives you strength as a writer but also gives you strength in your scene to really make it feel full. And if it's something that you need to work on, I'm going to give you the opportunity now. What you're going to do is you're going to get a pen and paper or a computer, I always write on computer, uh, and just type away. And we're going to take two minutes and the timing card is going to count you down through that two minutes. And don't worry when you write, this is a free writing exercise, you can always edit later. And I have lots to say about editing later on my website where I have tons of free exercises and things for you to try. This one is just about free writing. So what I want you to do is take the first minute of our two minute exercise to describe this space that you are in right now. Really notice the details. Think about the order as you write those elements down. Are you jumping in your mind from one thing to another or can you make it flow as you inhabit the space? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? Is it noisy where you are? Is it quiet? As you hit the one minute mark, I want you to imagine the place destroyed. I want you to either flood it or burn it down. And I want you to imagine yourself standing or sitting there. And I want you to take that second minute to describe what that feels like. So we're going to run a two minute timer. Obviously, you can do this exercise after this video too at your leisure. But I'd really love to challenge you to take those two minutes to do that writing exercise now and just try it out. The next scenic element we're going to focus on is crucial. It is dialogue. A book that is dialogue heavy starts to become a play or a radio piece or a TV show. A book that has no dialogue at all can have uh, intentional claustrophobia to it. 
but there is something about dialogue that helps us see and feel our characters in a way that we just cannot experience them unless we have dialogue. I know a lot of us find dialogue really difficult, and that's because it is. And here are some things I want you to think about to help you improve your dialogue. Firstly, remember that it's an artifice. You are not actually replicating how people speak. You're not spending time with the, hi, how are you? What did you watch on Netflix? Oh, that sounds interesting. I'll watch that too. That is not what you're trying to do when you're writing dialogue. What you're trying to do is move your story forward and reveal character. You are not trying to story tell within the dialogue. You can't be saying, oh yes, remember when we murdered that guy and buried him in the yard? Because the other person already knows that. And to create that sense of reality, you have to have a lack of exposition, a lack of trying to shove into the dialogue things that you're trying to tell the reader. So it really comes down to show, don't tell, which is something that writers teach and talk about a lot. But in dialogue, it's most important. So if your dialogue is strong, you don't need to tag it with, she exclaimed, she gasped, she exploded. Your words in your dialogue do the work for you. So having strong dialogue gives your reader the sense that they see who those characters are and they really get a sense of what's happening in the story and how it's moving forward. And the way to do that is to keep your characters in conflict with each other. So while they're talking, one wants something and the other wants something opposing. And that's a way for you to really tighten up and practice as a writer. And the more you practice, the same as scales on a piano um, or, you know, chopping onions in the kitchen, the more you go over these practice techniques, the better you'll get. And the other thing you can do, of course, is read great plays and watch great TV. This is my license to you to watch TV and listen to how those extraordinary scriptwriters, particularly with some of these long series forms that you can see now where the dialogue is lauded and have been awarded prizes, you can really get a sense of how somebody has used dialogue to move and to shape the story and to move and shape the reader too. So what you're gonna do now is another exercise. So we have these two exercises back to back and then we'll have a little pause on thinking time. So this exercise is one where I want you to imagine two characters. It can be you, it can be people you know, it can be characters you're working with in a story you're enjoying writing right now or a story you're hoping to write one day. They can be kids, they can be adults, they don't even have to be people, but they do need to be able to speak. These two characters are sitting upon a bench. One has something that the other one wants. And so use this opportunity to really focus on the dialogue. You don't need to tell me they're on a bench. You don't need to go into detail about the weather or describe what each other's wearing. You don't even really need to tag the dialogue for the moment. He said, she said, just write down what you hear in your mind, these two characters saying. You only get two minutes. You cannot get it wrong. If you're finding that you run out of things to say, make there be conflict. Make them refuse what the other one wants and see if you can manage it without becoming a shouting, screaming match, or maybe it does, but how can you artfully increase that tension? You've got two minutes, go.
What I'd like to read to you now is a short scene from one of my chapter books. Uh, this is Polly Diamond. She's uh, one of the characters that I love. And in this scene, um, what you'll see, hopefully, is that you get a sense that I'm trying to use some of these elements together. So I'm using some dialogue, a little bit of description, and then the other two elements that we're going to look at in the second half of this workshop. So Polly has a book. It's magic. Everything she writes in it comes true. She's just walked into her room and her book has turned her room into an aquarium. I spread out my arms. I spin around. Fish flash past. Big ones, tiny ones, yellow ones, purple ones. A crab scuttles along the baseboard. I open my book and write, You turned my room into a real aquarium? Do you like it? I love it. What else can you do? Anything you can imagine. You just have to write it down. Ideas fizz into my head like bubbles in soda pop. Heaps of chocolate, a cell phone, a bigger house, my own bedroom, more books, a flat screen TV, a four poster bed, a water slide, a horse, a dragon to go to the moon or Mars or Hogwarts. Yikes! This list could get really long. Then in my head, mum says, tell me something kind you did today. Hmm. I think. I think a little more. Then I write, I wish for world peace. I fill up with happiness at how kind and thoughtful I am. Polly, the book writes, I imagine a world with no war. Everyone would smile all the time. And of course, everyone would be very grateful to me, Polly Diamond. I imagine getting a big award. Polly, what? I can't make world peace happen. The image of me shaking, the president's hand bursts. I start to write, how about a... But the door swings open. Anna stomps in. That's her little sister. Polly, where are you? Don't you remember the rule, I say. No. She scampers around my room like an excited puppy. Pretty fishies. You have to knock before you come in. It's my room too. You have to share. She reaches for a yellow fish. Don't touch anything, I say. She snatches the yellow fish from the wall. It flops out of her hand like a bar of soap in the bath. The fish lies gasping on the floor. Its mouth pops open and shut. Look what you've done! I run over and pick up the fish. It shoots from my hand toward the watery wall. It swims into the shimmering blue. Anna reaches for a striped fish. Stop it, Anna! No, she says. I'm a mermaid. You're not a mermaid, but I'll turn you into a, into a banana if you're not careful. I grab my book. She dives for a fish. It darts away. Quickly, I write, Anna is a banana. There's a pop. And then, lying on the floor, is a banana. A perfect yellow banana. So... The reason I wanted to read that scene to you is because it uses those two elements to the best of my abilities. Uh, it uses dialogue, it uses description, not description heavy because it is for younger readers. And it also uses a lot of our next element, which is action. Action is what makes the book go forward. It's when things happen, it's when characters make things happen or things happen to the characters. And it's an opportunity all the time for you as a writer to show who your characters really are because your character is not what they say they are, it is what they do. I can tell you a thousand times that I'm a really nice person, but if I walk over and slap you in the face, I am not. OK, and so the way this works in a book is if you feel like a character is telling you all the time they're so great or they're so friendly, but they're actually rude to other people in the book, that can be an opportunity for the reader to see, OK, in their actions, this character is not who they say they are, or it can be a misstep by you as the writer. You think your character's one way, but they keep misbehaving. They want to be different. And so what I notice when I'm reading uh, manuscripts by people who enjoy writing and who want to publish is that 
sometimes it's action heavy. So much is happening and so fast that it can be a little hard to catch your breath. There's not enough description. There's not enough dialogue. There isn't space for us to know the characters well. And that can work well. It can be the effect you're looking for. But conversely, I see a lot where people have great characters and great description, but the character maybe is sitting in a room looking at photographs and nothing's really happening. There's no real opportunity for me to see that character slapping someone around the face or being aggressive or being funny or traveling through the world or buying something in the store, then I know what they want to buy. Every time I see an action, I get to know the story better and it moves the plot forward. So it's again, it's an artful choice. How much action do I want in this scene? Have I thought about how much action is in each of the scenes as I look at each pearl? <laughs> which seems silly like reading the pearls of my story but I'm not I'm not trying to say it like that but if you think about it as a pearl how can you make each of your pearls in your in your story shine do you have enough action have you just written a whole scene where not enough happens which was useful for you as the writer to know things better about your book but it may not be enough to stay on the pearl necklace you're trying to create so we have an exercise for you what you're going to do is you're going to write without stopping, just pure action. And so I'm going to give you a fairly ridiculous set of scenarios and you are going to put your character, so it can be you, it can be any character you've chosen, maybe someone from the bench in the last exercise, and you're going to have that character act and react so you get to know them. So let's say it's a terrible day in the life of the character and they've just woken up and they've realized that every other human being has vanished. If your character stays in bed and puts the cover over their head, they're a very different type of person to the character who races to the hardware store and buys themselves all sorts of things to cope with their survival. Neither is a better person necessarily, just who they are. So if you're ready, what will happen is I will give you a scenario, you will write for 30 seconds, there'll be a beep, and then I'll give you the next scenario. And we are going to do four scenarios. So four for 30 seconds each. Right, right, right. Things that happen, then what happens, then what happens, then what happens, then what happens. It's not about good writing. It's about getting your brain thinking about action. Your first scenario is that a ship is sinking. What does your character do? Your next scenario is that your character hears somebody screaming at the back of a store. What does your character do? Your next scenario is that your character is at the zoo when one of the animals escapes. What does your character do? Your final scenario is that your character is standing when the ground beneath him or her or he, she shakes. 
What does your character do? So from that exercise, I hope you've thought a little bit about how your character reacts and acts in the moment. And I know it may seem a little frivolous to spend time honing that one skill, but some of us are better at it than others. Some of us find action really, really difficult. They have these fabulous characters and they don't get them doing enough. And some of us find that, okay, action's really good. I'm good. I don't need to work on that. But when I think about it, my description is... A little bit lacking um, and that's probably where I'd put myself I'm okay getting my characters doing stuff but I really struggle with taking the time to observe and get that sensory feel to the book the last element is one where we're not going to do an exercise but I just want you as you read to notice how other writers you admire do it because this is really about going inside the characters in your scene and it's called the interior monologue. So this is your fourth element and it's something that some people find really challenging. Uh, a lot of us struggle with even how to put it on the page. You know, do you italicize it? Do you put I think? And that's stuff that you have to choose your own style with how your interior monologue works. But basically it's when you let us know what's going on inside a character's mind. So in Polly Diamond, there was a very brief moment of interior monologue when Polly imagined what it would be like to be shaking the president's hand because she's filling up with happiness at how kind she's been. Um, and this scene here is um, about a young woman who I never had the pleasure of meeting. Her name is Carly Allison, and she had a very aggressive cancer that she faced with huge tenacity and spirit. And I was invited by um, the publisher and the Allison family to do the research to put together this book about her life. So this is a book of non-fiction. And most of the book is in the voices of the people who loved Carly. But what became apparent was that I would need some moments in the book that belonged to Carly, where she wrote herself what had happened. So to do that, I had to do a lot of research. I had to really get a sense of why I was including that scene because I could not get it wrong because Carly was a real person. And then I ran each of those scenes by her family and her friends to make sure I had every detail accurate. But what you'll see is there is quite a bit of interior monologue and a little bit of all of those other elements in this scene too. Carly. I'm in my bedroom, but everything's changed. I'm listening to Taylor Swift change, and I vow to myself that even though my life has changed, I'm going to regain control of it. I think about how I felt when I first arrived at the hospital and how quickly my world turned upside down. I look at the words on my wall, love, hope, dance, dream, and now the quotations from my friends that were on the ICU wall, especially, never give up. I'm going to be the person I know I can be, the person my grandmother saw when she saw me. I am not going to put doubts in my mind. And the first thing I'm going to do is get my singing voice back. I'm going to live the way I always lived before, just even better. I try to sing along to the song. Immediately, my voice breaks through the trach tube. It makes me want to scream. Not that I could probably scream very loudly right now. The scream would come out as a croak. I try again and again until it actually hurts. One amazing thing that has come out of this so far is the blog. It was given to me as an assignment, as I guess I can't really go to school for the moment, but I'm loving how people are responding to my words, how they are fighting this with me. I can't yet name the thing I'm fighting. I find it hard to let that word come to my mind. Not yet. That hurts even more than singing. 
I read over the updates I put on my blog and smile at the responses. I'm so excited that Dad's friend Michael has offered to help me get the word out there. He said he could be our media spokesperson. I laughed. Well, it probably didn't sound like a laugh through my trach, but he was serious. He said, Carly, you have a story to share. You can make a difference and I can help you. You got this, Carly, I say to myself. Yes, I do. I need to stop feeling sorry for myself. This isn't me. I'm going to get out there and beat this thing. I reach my arms up and do a slow twirl in the middle of my room. Much as everyone was amazing at the hospital, I love being back in my own space. I imagine myself going on the ice and spinning. I tip my head back and start to cough. I am dizzy and breathless. I sit on the edge of the bait bed. I hate to admit it, but I am too weak to skate. Today, there is no way I could get onto the ice. Maybe tomorrow. I make myself get back up. I don't want to give the doubts in my mind time to grow and sitting around really isn't doing me any good. I head into my bathroom and put on some makeup, a soft cut of lipstick, a little blush. I pout at the mirror. I got this. I do. I post a happy photograph to Instagram. Someone pushes open my door. You're supposed to knock. I say as I come out of the bathroom to see my sister standing in the middle of my room. What? You look nice. That's all, she says. Thanks. I pull a goofy face at her. Why are you in here? It's just nice to have you back in your room. I bet you're just trying to borrow something. She giggles. No, I'm serious. I missed you. What? I insist. What is it you want? Okay, okay, your blue shirt. It would look good with these jeans, right? The shirt you're wearing looks good with these jeans, but fine. I go to my impeccable closet and pull down the shirt she wants. This better not be crumpled on the floor of your room tomorrow. Promise. Thanks, Carl. You're the best. Yeah, yeah. Now get out of here. She pauses at the door. I did miss you. I am glad you're back. I'm about to tell her that I missed her too, but her phone rings and she heads off to answer it. I glance at the sock monkey John gave me. My whole body thrills as if he's in the room with me. I remember what happened between us last night and I smile. It is our secret. I press my lips together and follow Sammy out of the room and make my way downstairs. I might not be able to sing. I might not be able to skate. I might be feeling just a bit sorry for myself right now, but I can still eat a muffin and hang with my mum in the kitchen. For today, that's okay. Tomorrow, I will be better than this. So I wanted to read that to you because even though the actions in it are muted, Carly isn't able to do much. Um, it gives you a sense that how action can play with interior monologue, because there's a lot of interior monologue in that scene, to try and round out a moment so you feel fully there. The description is light, but it's there. The ICU um, quotations on the wall, the sock monkey that John gave her, and then the dialogue with her sister. And I noticed that both Carly and Polly are trying to keep their sisters out of their room. Uh, maybe something I had to deal with when I was a kid. Um, so what I've tried to convey in our time together is that each of us as writers have strengths. And when it comes to creating the scenes of the stories we're trying to tell, all of us are good at some of those elements and all of us can practice some of the other elements. Um, hopefully in those exercises that we've covered and in some of the readings, what I've been trying to illustrate is that with patience and lots of editing, each of those books, I edited tons and rewrote tons. I have tried to use to the best of my ability the things I'm able to use as a writer and the things I've had to work on as a writer to create moments that tell the stories I want to tell. Your stories will be really different. And the magic of working in those scenic ways is that it empowers you to create the stories that you want to create, whether you're using nonfiction and filling a scenic moment or a chapter book for young readers, or a novel for adults. Whatever you're trying to do, thinking about where you can hone and enhance your skills and ability. And as you're reading, noticing which writers use those elements and how they use them well to make you feel really fully part of the story. You can break all the rules. It's uh, easy and interesting to try once you've got a good grasp of all of these elements, or all four of them, uh, to take all of them away. So in my book, Life on the Refrigerator Door, I use almost none of those elements to create a story. And instead, I just use notes between a mother and daughter to convey an emotional feeling. And there's lots of ways you can try to break all the rules and write scenes using 
maybe elements I haven't thought of, but getting a good grasp technically of those four elements, I really think will help you enjoy your writing process more. If there's stuff that you found useful or exciting or interesting, or you want to try more exercises, I have tons on my website for free uh, for you to have a look at and to take some more time with any of the exercises we've done today. I'm very happy for you to spend longer than two minutes or 30 seconds on those elements. If you want to try interior monologue, I suggest you write a diary entry from someone who's in prison and who has had a day where they have not been allowed out of their cell but has been given pen and paper and I invite you to spend time just really being inside somebody's mind and then just look at how those four elements play in the books you love, how they speed a story up or slow a story down, how they make you feel connected or intentionally disconnect you, how they make the book claustrophobic, how they make you feel fully part of what's happening in the story and enjoy it. Good luck with your writing.